I'm back from a beautiful weekend relaxing in the French countryside and I've got a traditional knitting podcast for you today. I have a finished object which is my Galan sweater. I've got a couple works in progress and also a test knit to talk about which if you've been here for any length of time you know I never do test knits. And I've also got some kind of random acquisitions to go through so if that seems interesting please stick around. Welcome everyone, I'm Sherry and I am a knitter currently living in Amsterdam for the last seven years with my husband Robert. We are back today in the OG uh, podcast space. So I've been filming the last few episodes in my living room, which has much more of a Scandinavian minimalistic feel compared to this room. This is sort of the only room in the house is, that is a tiny bit more chaotic. Uh, I ran a poll on Instagram a few weeks ago to see which space you guys were preferring and I actually really expected the living room space to win but it was very much 50-50. Um, I think this space won out a little bit so I'm actually just going to kind of switch it up depending on what the light's doing. There's way better light in the living room than this office um but i think what you guys are maybe drawn to here is also uh alfredo here in the background so this is my monstera plant that my husband and i got during covid and partly why i haven't been filming in here is you can see at the bottom there um he is kind of turning a little bit yellow and i think i haven't been a very good plant mama in the last bit i have been horrible about watering him and now I'm a little bit worried that maybe I've overwatered him. If any of you are, what is it, horticologists um, and really have a good green thumb and have some tips for how to maybe bring him back to life, uh, let me know because I, I definitely don't want to see him go. He was really thriving for a bit there and now, yeah, I need to nurse him back to health. So yeah, tips please if you have them. Like I said in the intro, we just got back from a weekend in the French countryside where one of my friends lives. So we went out to visit and just have a really chill, relaxing uh, weekend. They kind of live on, I think, what did they say? Three hectares of land. I'm not sure what that is in acres. Uh, they've got their own garden. It's just like a beautiful, peaceful space. Um, so yeah, we went to the beach one day. We really did a lot of relaxing. We had an epic karaoke session. <laughs> they have karaoke at their house and we did four hours on Saturday night, which I was in heaven. I absolutely love karaoke. Uh, and if you want to know my kind of go-to songs, let me know in the comments. So that was really nice. Um, we... We're in a town that I honestly have no idea what the name is, but we flew into a place that I have never heard of. And it's actually kind of funny because I was telling my team member in France where we were going and I was like, oh yeah, now Nantes. And she just stared at me and you know when people are trying to process what you're saying and like not have to ask you to repeat it, they'll, they'll just figure it out. She was trying so hard and I could see it on her face and I'm like, okay, well, I guess by your face, I haven't been saying that properly. And she's like, no, I have absolutely no idea what you've said. So I spelled it out N-A-N-T-E-S, which in my English speaking brain would be Nantes. Um, and apparently it's pronounced no. Like, so basically similar to N-O-N-T. So a lot of sounds don't really happen there. Um, so yeah, learn something new. It was a place I'd never been, um, so we flew into there, into Na, and then uh, our friends picked us up, and we were about an hour away from there and about 30 minutes from the beach, so that was really, really nice. Um, it was exactly what I needed right now, and yeah, now we're back in Amsterdam, so I figured I'd sit down and finally film a podcast. Uh, I've actually been trying to be a bit better about doing it every two weeks, but my schedule just didn't allow for it. And I was really trying to get my Galan sweater done and blocked so that I would have that to talk about. And it took a little bit longer to um, dry than I expected. So getting started today with my finished objects, I just have the one, which is the Galan sweater from Kadri. And this is probably the fastest that I have ever knit a sweater before. It 
took me two weeks total. So if I count it from the day that I ripped out and then restarted it, because if you remember from last episode, I knitted on two small needles, the yoke is way too small. I ended up starting it completely over on five millimeter needles. And from that moment on, so I knit a lot of it while we were in Italy in March and made a ton of progress there. I got through, I think, half the body, maybe the whole body there, almost. Uh, yeah, almost the whole body. So the only reason it even took two weeks, I think I could have had this done easily in like a week and a half, is because it took a week for the yarn to arrive. So I originally had six skeins of this uh, Wolf Oak Far Four, Wolf Oak, Wolf Folk Four yarn that I had bought in Canada on my trip home last year. And I was really hoping to be able to stretch that to the full kind of sweater, not have to buy another skein because it's not the cheapest yarn, but I just couldn't make it work. Um, the body would have been way too short and you'll see when I stand up in a second that, um, yeah, there was really no way that I could have stretched this out without it feeling way too small. So I kind of gave in, found the yarn thankfully in Germany. There was really only one place in Europe that I could find it. And it was 23 euros for the skein, which was uh, quite a bit more than I paid in Canada. And then another 12 euros in shipping. So yeah, that ended up being quite an expensive uh, mistake to not buy enough yarn when I originally bought it. But I only had 852 yards to start. And so I don't know what I was thinking when I bought it. I was just like, yeah, six skeins. That's usually what I would get, size small. Uh, didn't help that I also had to knit a size medium for this. Um, so yeah, that's fine though. Um, I am super happy with this sweater. So it is just like your really basic top down raglan sweater. The main difference here is the raglan is done via lifted increases. So let me get in here. Um, so just like a really subtle raglan. There is no short rows, it's stockinette down. Uh, once you're done the increases, that's the most complicated part other than maybe like the I cord. And yeah, that's why I think it went so, so fast. I used the Mohair Galant sweater pattern from Kadri because it called for a worsted weight, which this wool folk yarn is. Uh, the four yarn is, let me check, 100% wool merino. It's a chain at blown yarn and it is super, super soft. So this is like a um, strand that I've already kind of used so it doesn't look as beautiful as it should. Oh, maybe here. Here's a unused portion of it. So really really nice um this is all that i have left i believe it's 19 grams of yarn so um i maybe could have added a tiny bit more length to the body or sleeves but i don't think it was necessary if anything i would have added it to the neck so i am incredibly happy with my yarn choice on this i think it worked out beautifully for this sweater it is so soft it feels like a cloud on my body i mean this really feels as light as wearing mohair without the itch. So I highly recommend using this. I knit it on five millimeter needles. So I went up a needle size from the pattern. Um, and I think it actually worked quite well. It doesn't look too, too uh, open. So it did kind of stretch out a little bit. And then it's actually kind of funny on uh, the sleeves, I realized when I had finished my second sleeve and I was putting my needles back in my case, I knit both sleeves, thankfully I did it to both, on the four and a half millimeter needles. So it's not a huge deal because, I mean, you do your decreases and then you just link to the knit, or knit to the length that you want your sleeve to be. So in the end, the sleeves are long enough, like I'm actually really, really happy with how they turned out. And they blocked out enough that it doesn't feel like they're too tight or anything. I just thought it was funny that I somehow ended up 
yeah, using the wrong needle size. And that's really just been a common theme on a lot of my, I think almost every single project I've been working on lately. I am making the weirdest, stupidest mistakes. Um, and I'm getting a little bit frustrated with myself, but I think it's just also a sign of like where my mental state is right now. I've had a lot of life stuff going on, which I can't talk about yet, but I will probably in a future episode when I can share more. And yeah, I think just with kind of all the turmoil and chaos happening right now, I have not been paying attention. And so a lesson that I've really learned at the moment is when I'm working on anything, like check the count of my stitches, make sure I'm working on the correct side, make sure I'm using the correct needles. This is not the first time that I've used the wrong needles on something. Um, and so I just, I need to force myself to be a little bit more present right now in the in the moment that I'm knitting. Um, because yeah, even on a basic sweater, I somehow made a pretty major mistake, but thankfully it worked out. Um, I really didn't want to have to rip back and do this over. Okay, let's talk specs for the sweater. So pre-block, the length was 50 centimeters, the sleeves were 40 centimeters, and the bust was 91 centimeters. Post block, I actually lost a centimeter on the length, um, but I think also it's because I didn't really attempt to block that out. I didn't pin it or anything. I was quite happy with the length already. Um, the sleeves grew to 49 centimeters, so I got nine centimeters of extra length, which was really good because I didn't have really enough yarn to make a huge difference on the sleeves. So I'm really, really happy with how those grew, especially given the incorrect needle size. And the bust is now 102 centimeters, which I think is the perfect amount of positive ease. And I knit somewhere between the small and medium size on this. So I cut out a round of decreases uh, for the medium. And I also adjusted the sleeve decreases because, because of the um, raglan modification or the decreases. I had less stitches on the sleeve, so I couldn't really follow the pattern exactly. So I did 11, I think 11 rounds of decreases every ninth row. Uh, so I'm really happy with the mods that I made on this. Uh, cost wise, so I'm going to split this into sort of two costs. The amount that I paid in Canada for the yarn, so I paid $27 Canadian per skein, which at the time was roughly 18 euros uh, per skein. So total cost came to 108 euros for the six skeins that I bought in Canada, which in my head, I felt like it was more money than that, but that's actually not too bad. It is maybe a lot of money for a really basic sweater, but I think it's one I'm gonna get a lot of wear out of. Then there's the cost of the German yarn, which I said was 23 euros for the one skein plus 12 euros for the shipping. So that was 35 euros just for that. So the total cost of the project was 143.80, which isn't, well, I know it's not the most expensive I've ever bought because I think I said my um, cardigan number four was more than that, but yeah, for a basic sweater, I would say this is on the pricier side of what I would usually pay. Typically, I would spend under 100 euros for yarn, even with mohair. So it's a lot, but I think just based on how this feels, the color of it, the overall style of it, I'm going to get a lot of wear. And let me just step back and I will kind of show you the overall look. So I think overall, lengthwise, I'm really happy with it. Sleeves, um, they have kind of stretched back up a little bit, so maybe they're not quite 49 centimeters, but I think they hit me where I would like. And then um, we have, well, the I-cord, which is on the sleeves and the body, and then the neck. So I, yeah. I'm happy. There's no German short rows, so it does ride up a little bit in the back. And I think, I think if I'd had more yarn in the end, I 
would have loved to actually put in short rows to this. I do think it would just give it a little bit more of an elevated feel. And I know going through project notes, quite a lot of people did put in German short rows in the end. So that would have been a simple modification to kind of elevate it from a very, very basic sweater. But also if you are a newer knitter and you're looking for something really simple to knit that looks beautiful and isn't just the novice sweater from Petite Knit, I would highly recommend this one. It was really easy to follow uh, and it's gorgeous. And as you can see, you can also swap out something other than mohair. My main issue with the sweater, which is my fault, <laughs> um, is the neck. So I don't think I knit it quite to the height that it was supposed to be. So I think I probably should have added like another centimeter or two. Because as you can see too, I think because this is a medium, not a small, it is stretching out a little bit here. So it is, as I'm wearing it, kind of starting to droop and it's not really the funnel neck that it's meant to be. It doesn't bother me a ton. I'm still going to wear this a lot, but it is something I wish I had adjusted. And I would actually really love to get all of your feedback on that. Do you think that I could... Um, kind of rip out the neckline here so the bind off or the cast on uh, pick up stitches and knit up or do you think because I'm going in the wrong direction from the rest of the sweater that would look really weird because then it would be quite evident I'm also thinking maybe of just putting in a thin elastic to try to tighten it back up again but let me know your thoughts. Um, it's something that I've never done as a modification before to go back in and fix that. And I don't want to end up ruining this sweater, so I'm a bit hesitant to touch it again. Um, especially because the yarn itself, like also once it's been worked up, it uh, isn't the nicest looking after. So yeah, give me your tips. Um, let me know. Or do you think it just looks fine as it is? It's not exactly the style it was supposed to be, but it's also not the end of the world. I really, really wish that I could like transfer the feeling of this yarn through the screen to all of you, because I just would love if you could feel it. I'm sure many of you have touched chain eye yarn before, but this one just feels really, really special. So definitely recommend the Wolf Oak for yarn uh, if you have a chance to get your hands on it. I obviously can't speak to the long-term wear of it. Maybe it'll start to pill quite a lot, but so far uh, it's definitely a yarn that I would buy again um, if I had easier access to it. But I might be going home in June, so maybe I'll pick myself up some more if uh, Statement Junkie still has it. So that's my Gallant sweater, my finished object for today. And like I said, maybe there's some small modifications I would make, but I think this is kind of the happiest I've been with a finished object in a while. So overall, like tens across the board. Moving on to works in progress. So I only really have two to share today. I've been trying to be a bit of a monogamous knitter because I'm feeling super inspired right now and I have so many projects I want to cast on. I've been going a little bit crazy with the yarn shopping. I also have a lot of online carts with yarn in it just waiting for me to click yes, but I don't want to buy a bunch of yarn that I like can't cast on right away. That drives me crazy personally. So I'm trying to hold off, but I don't know, there's something about spring knitting right now that just has me so energized and I just, I wanna knit everything, literally everything. So I'm trying to hold back, finish up a few projects and then move on from there. So the first finished object, and this is what I brought to France and predominantly worked on, uh, is my Sonia shirt. So this is by Paula Strict and it is just a, simple t-shirt um, but also not a simple t-shirt so last time i shared it on the podcast i had just knit literally the 60 rows of back panel here um and i you can see have made quite a lot of progress um maybe not a like massive amount for a t-shirt i did expect to knit a little bit more in france but I also wanted to be very present with our friends and enjoy the moment, so I tried to keep it to a minimum. Um, I am knitting this in the Wolf Oak, Wolf Oak, 
I am knitting this in Gepard uh, Wild and Soft, which is 40% uh, Wild Tusa Silk and 60% Merino Wool. And this is, I said it last time too, one of my new favorite yarns. I love the way it feels. I love the texture of it. I think it just gives like such an interesting um, dynamic to this piece and it really makes it look elevated. I have so many wonderful things to say about this pattern because it really does seem like a basic t-shirt, but there are all these little details that you read in the pattern that just like take it up a notch to something really professional and polished looking. So to start, there is this back line, which you can see is on uh, try on tubing as well for this middle piece. And this basically you cast on, you knit around, and then you add in a lifeline and then you continue knitting. And what that lifeline does is it gives you the visual to then go in and let me see if I can show it to you. It gives you the visual to then go in and pick up stitches later. So what you do, so I had a thin thread going through it, which uh, if I can give you a tip, if you ever do this, uh, where's my thread? Don't use something that is like basically the same color as your yarn. Um, I just grabbed the pure silk that was near me and threw it in as my lifeline. It did make it a little bit difficult to actually see when I had to go in and pick up those stitches. It wasn't impossible, but I just had to do it in daylight. Uh, apologies if there is quite a bit of background noise right now. Uh, it's Amsterdam and people are moving and I think the garbage truck is across the street. So yeah, it's city living. It's the only moment I really had to record. So yeah, uh, please bear with me. Uh, but if it's loud, that's why. Okay, where was I? Yeah, so um, don't use the kind of similar color for the lifeline. Then you go in, you pick up stitches, and then you kind of knit uh, your shoulder panels. So you knit forward, you knit forward, and then you join in the round for the body. And then the other special detail of this so far is then when you join in the round for the body, you also have this kind of side seam detail. So the way that it is, is it's uh, center double decreases for this top part here that's kind of angled in. And then you carry on with a faux seam, which is just slip stitches and knits. And so that one isn't as prominent and noticeable, but it will carry down the side. The only downside of that detail is it does make it a little bit harder to just work on mindlessly because you can't just knit in the round as you would like. You do have to pay attention to, am I on a slip stitch round or a knit round so that you don't mess it up and ruin the detail. So that is my progress there. And then I also read forward and when you get to the bottom of the body, I think it's 48 centimeters. Um, you then actually bind off and purl stitch but you put in a lifeline first, so similar to what you did for the top um, line section. You put in a lifeline, you bind off purl-wise, and then you go in and you pick up your stitches again as you did at the top, and then you knit the twisted rib. So then you end up with this little like detail border between the body and the rib, and it sounds like you do the same on the neckline and the arm. So that does make it a little bit more of a tedious knit um, because you are binding off, picking up, doing twisted ribs. So it's not moving as quickly as I would like, but this has been my main whip right now. I am hoping to finish it by the end of the month. So I've got a couple more weeks. And then I am also really trying with my spring style to buy clothes from retail that really like um, all go together. So I'm trying to focus more on like a navy brown cream color palette this season so that all my new wardrobe can be kind of interchanged with each other. And I'm also gonna try to be more mindful of that with my knits. So I think this is gonna fit in perfect with some of the pants that I just bought. Um, I also think the cardigan I'm making, which I'll, 
kind of show in a second will be similar. So I'm feeling good about being like more uh, intentional with the colors that I select, the clothes that I buy to complement my own knit pieces and really feeling like I don't just have a knitted wardrobe that's thrown together with other things, uh, which has kind of tended to be how I have worked in the past. So that's the Sonia T. I feel like I'm missing a detail, but hopefully that covers it all. Then we have the second whip, which is my Milady's dress. Um, so kind of based on everything I said around being a bit distracted lately and making mistakes, uh, this piece was no exception. And it's actually why I put it on hold for about a week. Um, so there was no way I was bringing this to France to try to work on around other people and it's also just like getting so difficult to transport. So I made a lot of progress. Um, last week I had just, or last podcast, I had just finished the lower bodice. I uh, hadn't done any of the straps. So this is one strap, two strap for the v-neck and then yesterday I worked on the back square neckline and I am just about to um, start on the left sleeve uh, for the back. So as you can see there are so many lifelines uh, and cords coming out of this. It is getting a little bit difficult to maneuver and it is definitely getting tangled all the time. Um, I measured it when I finished the straps for the front and for the most part I am perfectly matching the pattern. The only thing is the strap length I am expecting uh, and she says like you'll probably need to add length but I think I'm gonna finish all the straps and attempt to place it on my body and see how much length I need to add before I actually go in and do that. So it's why I've just put it on try on tubing. I left enough yarn that's all tangled in here, you know, this soupy mess. Um, but I do think within the next couple days, I will be done the top section and ready to move on to the skirt. And I have been filming, well, continuing to film my vlog on this dress, which I actually noticed, um, especially the second video didn't perform that well. In general, I think the vlogs just aren't as popular as a podcast episode, which I get. I also don't really watch uh, vlogs that much, but if there's something particular that you don't like about the style of those videos or a tip that you have to make them a little bit more interesting for you, just let me know. Um, you know, I'm continuing to film them and I have time to make edits and change the style if there's something specific that you wanna see. Uh, I will admit vlogging so far hasn't been my most favorite activity because I find it like when I'm knitting then I need to be like, okay, I need to get the camera out and film it and talk about it. And I tend to just be a person that likes to sit down and knit. But now that I've started it, I intend to finish, but I want to make sure that those videos are also of value. So feel free to give me your thoughts. Um, I have a group chat for this dress on... Uh, Instagram and I think now there's six of us seven of us total and everybody that has kind of already started the project is also moving really fast so I think all of us have made mistakes at one point like I accidentally picked up the wrong side of the v-neck I picked up the right sleeve instead of the left and then thankfully they were mirrored and um, or not even mirrored the first kind of eight repeats are exactly the same, so thankfully I didn't have to go back and rip anything out. But I think all of us have made mistakes just because the pattern is very involved. There's a lot of like, do this, but at the same time do that, and then also do this other thing. Okay, and now your decreases are done here, so stop this, but do this other. So that part can be a little bit of a puzzle and a mind game that you need to, um, work around but actually the knitting part of it once you actually start once you've like mapped out and maybe i'll just show you like 
like this is sort of before I sit down and do anything, I literally go in and I highlight and I mark everything down and take copious notes for myself. So as long as you do that and you understand what you're trying to accomplish, it isn't so bad once you're actually knitting. And all of us have made really fast progress. So I think if I had just only focused on this project and knit it monogamously, I probably could have finished that top section in a few days, maybe a week. So I think that says a lot too, because everybody's so scared of this dress because you're knitting and purling, it's done flat, it seems really overwhelming, but actually, because you're just knitting these thin straps for the most part, like the knitting and purling goes really quick. And I know anybody that started the skirt from our chat also was making pretty quick progress. So. I haven't even read through that part of the pattern yet. I may be thinking of doing it in the round, but maybe once I get there, I'll realize similar to the top that it's just too complicated to try to edit. So I might knit it flat because really the purling hasn't been awful. So I hope that that's the lesson to you all. I think a lot of people have that dress on their list and have been really, really scared to tackle it because it's like, oh, knit flat purling, it's long, it's gonna take me forever. But honestly, like I originally planned to make this dress for my trip to Sicily with my dad and stepmom at the end of May. And then once I started, I was like, oh, there's no way, I am so behind schedule, I'll never get this done. But I'm actually pretty confident now that I will get this done for May. And also I need to have those Sicily pictures. I need to be in this dress on a cliff with the water in the background. Like I, I have to have that picture. I'm gonna be really mad if I don't. So I am full steam ahead. I think like my Sonia tea and my Milady's dress will probably continue to be my main focus for the next couple podcasts. So hopefully you're enjoying seeing those because I may not have a ton of other stuff to share. But yeah, I think I'm gonna have them done hopefully pretty soon, and I am so excited to have a knitted dress. And if I didn't say it already, um, I am knitting it in pure silk, uh, deep petroleum blue, and I'm really, really liking the color of it. And also I just really love the pure silk. It's so um, lightweight, and I really like the texture that it creates. So that's my Milady's dress. Uh, it's by Vertnet. I also didn't say that, I apologize. <laughs> Um, I feel out of practice with uh, podcasting right now, so I'm doing my best. And it's not really a whip yet, and I realize I didn't mention it in my intro, but I did swatch for my Brady Loop cardigan by Other Loops. And this is in the Assayer uh, Jensen yarn in color 2S, paired with the mohair also into us. So this is just a light gray. I was a little bit worried it was going to seem too white and similar to my other cardigans, but actually this really just has a beautiful heathered gray cream effect that I am really, really happy with. So this is on gauge. Uh, I am one stitch off on the row gauge, but that's fine. I'll adjust in the pattern and maybe I'll cast that on because I do really want that piece in my wardrobe, but it's gonna be a secondary piece that I just work on here and there because it also is, I, I read through the first part of the pattern and I think the way that Other Loops writes her patterns can be a little bit confusing compared to like a petite knit or my favorite things knitwear. It's a little bit of mental gymnastics. So. Um, it's one I'm gonna have to pay attention to. It's definitely not gonna be a really simple knit, but I am ready to get that one started. And I just really want that piece, but I was like, okay, I'll swatch, but I'm not gonna focus on it too much because I don't have time. Then the test knit. So this is like more of my knitting plans and I guess, uh, I can't remember if this one has an actual deadline, but I'm, I'm sure it does. Um, and I wasn't originally gonna apply for it 
but I just, I really love the idea of having a knitted skirt in my wardrobe. And so when I saw the test knit for this come up, I had saved the pattern like months ago when, um, uh, what's her Instagram handle? Anne, Anne Katrine, what is that? Anne Catherine Stoll. Um, when she posted it a few months ago, I saved this fancy Pepita skirt and then when the test knit call came up, I was like, okay, I'll just throw my name in, I won't get this, and then I did. So this is going to be a really ambitious project for me. It is a kind of houndstooth pattern on the front, which is color work, um, it's knit flat, so you do the front panel and then the back panel and you seam it together. Um, and I have never ever done color work before. So I'm kind of <laughs> nervous and I got the yarn yesterday. Uh, so rather than doing the black and white like she has, I decided to go for more of a low contrast. So this will be my main color and this will be my um, contrast. So dark and light brown, I think it goes with the rest of the wardrobe that I am kind of curating right now. This is color 405 and color 404. And this is the uh, Lana Grossa Landlust Alpaca Merino 160, uh, which is 50% virgin wool and 50% baby alpaca made in Italy. It is really, really soft. I really love um, the feel of it. I got it yesterday. And then I started to swatch, um, which I've got some mistakes in here, so ignore it. I'm thinking it's maybe like a tiny bit too low contrast, but that might actually be for the best because I have a feeling I'm gonna make a lot of mistakes in this, so maybe I don't want it to be really, really evident um, in the final piece. This is actually my second attempt at the swatch and I still have a ways to go because my first one was so tight. Uh, so I spent about three hours last night just watching videos on color work and catching floats. <sighs> and also like, okay, how, like, should I just be knitting English style for both? Should I attempt to knit continental for one strand? I do think on the knit side, I'm a bit more confident in knitting English and continental combined. But when it comes to purling, I'm absolutely useless. And I think those rows are gonna be so slow. So one option for this skirt is I could always knit the back panel first because that part's gonna be really, really quick. Um, and then move on to the color work once I have a bit more um, time to focus on it. But I at least wanna do this swatch now to make sure that I'm capable of it. And then probably actually if I get the swatch down, then I'll have some momentum to feel confident in doing the color work. So maybe I should just continue so I don't lose that uh, steam and skill. But yeah, uh, it's definitely not easy to do color work when you are not a continental knitter and when you're just not used to it. And I don't know if I'll ever do this again, but let's see how it goes. So I think this is gonna be a bit of a slow, slow knit for me, uh, but I am gonna have to put some effort into it and try to get through it as quickly as possible because it is a test knit. Uh, but yeah, if you have any really good videos to help with English style knitting color work, um, please let me know. Uh, it is all a new world to me. And I feel like when I watch a bunch of your podcasts, everybody just seems to pick up color work so quickly. And it's like you do your first piece and it looks beautiful. Um, I don't think I'm going to have that experience. But let's see, I'll keep you posted. So yeah, that was something I got yesterday and quickly started, but not a ton of progress on it yet. Okay, those are all the actual knitting updates that I have. And then my acquisitions are a little bit uh, strange. Oh no, actually, sorry. 
I have one um, additional thing to mention that is like kind of knitting plans related. So um, a woman named Jo from Twin Set and Pearl reached out to me on Instagram. She had watched my spring knitting plans video and saw that I wanted to make a shawl. And she is a shawl designer. And so she offered to send me a pattern for free so that I could give that a try. Uh, the majority of her patterns are in fingering weight, which are perfect for spring. And so I went through her patterns and I came across the Cecil, it's either Cecil or Cecil <laughs> shawl. And it is a gorgeous uh, color block shawl. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. And the part that really, well, two things really uh, attracted me to this specific design. One, it's knit from tip to tip. So you never have the like huge amount of stitches on your needle. You just always have like a smaller amount and you're going from one end to the other. So that was point one. And then point two was it's in garter stitch with an I-cord edge. So. Knit wise, it should be pretty easy. Uh, the most complex part obviously being the color block and following the pattern. So I did find a few project notes that said, it can be a bit daunting and overwhelming to knit to the patterns, but I'm also like, it won't need to be absolutely perfect. And I think because a lot of the pattern calls for mohair and not a ton of it, I can probably use a lot of my mohair scraps, which I have a lot of from the years. And so I think I'm going to try to do um, a less like really high contrast piece, um, maybe like grays and purples. Um, I think I also have some like browns and whites. So I'm going to go through all my um, leftovers and see how much I have and how they're all working together and then, yeah, report back. Uh, it's not something I'm gonna cast on immediately, but I would like to cast that on in the next couple months. And if I need to buy some extra yarn for it, that's fine. Maybe I'll just use drops for a lower cost option paired with uh, maybe Filcolana Arweta for the main color. So thank you so much, Joe. That was really sweet of you. And I am really excited to have that shawl in my wardrobe and maybe that will make me fall in love with shawls. We'll see, it's not impossible. Okay, so then actually on to the acquisitions I have. So I watched Marianne's um, uh, podcast, well not podcast, I watched Marianne's video on kind of her knitting essentials. So that's uh, by Mwoo uh, here on YouTube and Instagram. And she really inspired me to get my knitting storage in order. So I have just had this like horribly messy um, shelf in our linen closet that is next to our couch in the living room. So I've just been throwing like all my knitting in there. It's been a disaster and I, was, I just keep thinking like, okay, I really, really want to fix this. And now that we got a new knitting chair in our living room, which I'll insert a B-roll of, I now have like a specific chair with like this table next to it that I can sit and knit. And it's kind of got this perfect space where I can hide a basket behind it so that I can always just have my knitting in that corner it doesn't need to be seen. It's not going to be distracting. And so I thought about getting the same kind of Ikea basket that everybody else has. But I was looking at this site called West Wing, which is quite popular here in the Netherlands. And they had this felt basket, which truly is actually a lot bigger and more sturdy than I was expecting. I thought it would like kind of collapse on itself and you could like hold the handles together that's not the case and when the box came I was like wow that's really overkill for the packaging only to find out no it wasn't that's literally the size of it but it's perfect because I can fit kind of everything in here plus multiple projects and then I went to the HEMA which is kind of like our equivalent of Target and they have all these um, makeup bags and these were, I think this one was like eight euros and this was four. So I got this little pouch to kind of travel in and just put all the accessories I need when I go on vacation. So this was perfect for France. 
Um, and then I got this makeup bag, which has a ton of pockets, side pockets, and I kind of like have all my knitting needle sets, all my stitch markers, everything in here. And then I also, uh, also at Hema, found, um, what was it? It's these little kids like bracelet bead sets. And they were, I think, perfect for knitting accessories. So I just dumped all the beads out and then you can actually like change where the little dividers are. So I now got one that has all my stitch markers and one that has like stitch stoppers, um, knitting needles, the tighteners for my child goose. So this is now my kind of organization because before I had this like, uh, I think Coco Knits wrap, which was like a roll that went together and the strap broke on it, it was falling apart. It was definitely not worth the 50 something euros that I paid for it. And I've been meaning to get something better, but I was like, oh, I don't want to buy an expensive, um, like, yeah, knitting bag or anything. And yeah, when I went to the store and I saw this, I was just like, oh, that's perfect. I don't need to spend a lot of money. And I think all of this was like, the basket was 34 euros and all the kind of bags and uh, stitch holders and that together were... I think 15 euros, maybe 20. So really, really affordable. And now all my knitting is organized. So I put my tripod in there and kind of all my knitting projects that I want next to me. And then I can just pick stuff up as I go. And then I also bought a stylus for my iPad so that I can now like actually handwrite my notes for the show and that and mark up patterns. Uh, a little bit more easily on my iPad, but this is an iPad mini and it's actually making me really, really want um, a bigger one. So not a pro maybe, but like just the regular iPad, but I'm trying to hold off because it's probably not money I need to spend right now. Um, yeah, that is everything for today. That felt like a lot. I've been talking for quite a while. Uh, I do have some more yarn coming, but it didn't arrive yet, so that will be for the next episode, and it's maybe for the best, because if it was here already, I'd probably be wanting to cast it on. Uh, I guess we're now at the part of the video where I ask you to subscribe, which I honestly always find this a little bit awkward, and I hate having to say this little speech at the end of every video, but it does mean a lot when you subscribe and comment and like. Um, you know, if you like my content, it's great if you stick around and get notified of new videos when I post them. I do try to post videos every couple weeks for podcast episodes and then sprinkle in additional content from there. I am expecting in the next few months, I'm going to be posting a lot more. And yeah, I hate asking for that. But uh, if you do like me and my content, please subscribe. So thank you so much for being here and sticking around and I look forward to sharing the progress in my next podcast.